Everything is under control, under my leadership. Unexpectedly, just before dawn on the 7th of February, the 29-year-old Duvalier dynasty came to a close as Baby Doc and Michelle drove through a gauntlet of newsmen to a waiting U.S. Air Force jet that flew them to exile in France. They had managed to get an estimated $800 million out of the country, leaving behind less than 500000 in the treasury. John Cole and Michelle Bennett take our money in AD. We have to give the money, money back. back. We have to give the money and give them back to our people. Over here, all of us. These are kids. All of us. All of us, brother. They were good people. We intend to pursue the Duvaliers to the ends of the earth to bring back the wealth of the country. And we're giving them notice that wherever they go, no matter how long it takes, we will get the money back. Chanel Nguyen, and today we are going to be talking about Baby Doc. I'm using Baby Doc and Jean Claude interchangeably in this video, just like I did in the other one. Same person, Jean Claude and Baby Doc. Now, in my previous video, we covered Papa Doc, also known as Jean Francois Duvalier. And when we left off of that video, he passed away and basically passed his throne down to his only son, Jean Claude Duvalier. And if you guys know anything about Jean Claude, you would probably know that he is literally the youngest president to ever be president ever in the history of presidents. This is because this happened when he was 19. Can you imagine a country being ran by a 19 year old? Ooh, child. Now before we get into this video, I'm gonna have to let you guys know, you guys are gonna have to do a lot of research on your own if you want more about this, because this video is already going to be really long, so grab your diri, grab your bonon, grab your cola laca, your cremas, all that, grab your snacks, grab your water, grab your tea, grab your liquor, because this is gonna be long, and I'm not even gonna be able to cover all of it, okay? So I will leave my sources down below in the description or in the pinned comment down below so you guys can start from there, but there is a lot to cover. But before we get started, I know you guys are gonna say something about my hair, yes, fresh retwist. It will be my next upload on Thursday. It's a vlog, okay, if you care about the update. It's been a month, it's about to be two months in about a week or two, so super cute. I love it, I love it. Uh, these glasses from a sponsorship, don't remember where they're from, and the shirt is in the merch shop. Make sure you guys go buy some merch. New merch coming soon, I know there's not much there, but everything you need is down in the description or in the pinned comment down below. So just in case you guys need a refresher, Jean-Francois Duvalier, aka Papa Doc, was one of Haiti's presidents, but what many like to call him, <laughs> dictator. He ruled on Haiti for a very long time. And during this entire time, he literally ran Haiti into a muck, okay? And it's funny because when I posted my last video, most of the comments were talking about people who have lost their family members during this regime. But there were a, a token few that were like, oh, this is when Haiti was the best. That Da, da, da. Hey, he was so clean. Hey, he was this. And I'm like, who knows? I'm sure it was, but this does not negate the fact that there are thousands of people who have been dead, missing, or exiled because of this. And people to this day who are still hurt and still know nothing about what happened to their family members because of all of this nonsense. So it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting because it's like, hmm. Haiti was already a poor country and still remains a poor country, but a lot of the Duvalier regime, both from Baby and Papa Doc, has a lot to do with it. 
from the Tonto Makut, which was a military slash cop type of force that they created during the regime to restore order and basically intimidate anyone into supporting them and not saying anything negative about the government to the people that have been exiled, killed, kidnapped, hurt, abused somewhat, some way by them to the people that's been thrown in jail for absolutely no reason, have been intimidated with the religion of Haitian voodoo in order to do certain things, companies and businesses being coerced into giving the government money to fund malicious covert operations that basically funded their lifestyles. Like there is so many human rights issues going on with the Duvalier regime that it, it, it's impossible to cover all in one video. If you guys want a better synopsis of everything, you have to watch my first video. It will be linked down below in the description or in the pinned comment. From people outside looking in, it looked like the Haitians were very compliant. But then again, to me, from what I see, it really looks like they were just observing to see what would happen, would things change, would things be different. On the other hand, you had people on the inside. The people that were like in the palace, people who were also political figures who assumed that power would go to them. And you guys are probably wondering like, well, it's common sense. Why would he not give the throne to his son if that's his only son? Baby Doc, okay, Jean-Claude was not the brightest, okay? He was not the brightest. He wasn't dumb, but he wasn't the brightest. Not only was he not the brightest, but he also had like no political background. See, unlike his father, he didn't spend much time in politics, in education. Like, he, he just did it. He literally lived the rich kid lifestyle. Like, he was out here just chilling kids of the elite while they're sitting there caring about, you know, politics and education and being the next kin of power of Haiti. He literally cared about riding his Harley Davidson in the backyard, chilling with the baddies on the yachts. Like, he really wasn't even trying to be president, to be honest with you. When his father spoke to him about it, he was like, mm, you know, maybe my sister should have the spot because she's more politically, you know, inclined. And you know, don't nobody go against Papa Doc's wishes. He was like, uh, no, you won't be president if you're not sick. That happened. And again, a lot of people were really jealous because it was like, how the hell are you gonna put a 19 year old that ain't that damn smart, that ain't got no type of like political background as president of Haiti, as if you ain't already fucked shit up. But you already know, as I said in the last video, ain't no defying with uh, Papa Doc says and even though he was dead there were people that were truly afraid of him it was like okay he's dead but a lot of people believe that he had some type of like powers that were beyond earthly like since he scared people the voodoo religion and dressed like Baal Samdi to terrify people and basically get them into doing whatever he wanted it was one of those situations where people were like mm, okay you know let, let's see it out let's not mess with the dead you know because Haitians are very superstitious people Haitians believe that when people die they're not dead okay Haitians never die I say that all the time I always say it like even me my mom be like oh you you gonna die like that don't do that I'm like man Haitians never die like we don't die I'm telling you we don't <laughs> so people were just like kind of walking on edge cells a little bit because it was like okay let's see what happens but for the most part, a lot of people kind of took um, Jean-Claude as a joke. And that's actually where the Baby Doc name comes from. He did not name himself Baby Doc. The media did. The journalists did. Especially the international ones. They thought this was so funny, okay? People were just in there like, y'all got a 19-year-old? Yeah. Okay, Baby Doc. Like, they, that, that's literally what happened. He did not name himself that. The people basically bestowed that name upon him. Now, in my previous video, I talked about the United States cutting aid to Haiti due to a lot of the embezzlement of funds and misuse of the country's funds to fund their private and luxury type of lifestyles. Now, the thing is, when Baby Doc came to power, basically America backed him. Like, if you don't get it together, we ain't giving you nothing no more. Okay, so you need to you need to clean this country up because at this point y'all looking bad to everybody and we can't keep giving you money if you guys are not going to actually use it to fix the country so that is what he did he did a lot for the country i'm not even gonna lie bro as a journalist i gotta remain non-biased okay with Papa Doc, I couldn't find out one thing he did. I don't know if it's that people just didn't want to report on it because they genuinely didn't like him 
or what. But I was able to find what Baby Doc did. He did a lot. He put more of a happy face to the Duvalier family. He also created the whole Duvalier-ism or Jean-Claude-ism type of situation. I didn't know whether to cry or laugh. And not to disrespect anyone who's been affected by the Duvalier regime, but I didn't know whether to cry because so many people have been hurt, killed, disappeared, and mistreated by this regime. Or laugh because there are actually Haitians that believe that these people did really good things. Like... I, I really don't want to be biased, but I don't see that much good compared to all the bad that Haiti still seems to go through to this day in 2020. Like, Haiti is still trying to recoup from the Duvalier regime. He opened up the palace for journalists, which is something that was, like, really hardly ever done when his father was in power. Like, he was not fucking with the journalists. He had a lot of journalists killed. And you know what's funny? When I first started looking into Papa Doc, it was looking into journalists who have been killed in Haiti or just journalists in Haiti in general. Because I went to school for journalism. I went to Bloomfield College for communications and I had a concentration in broadcast journalism. And later on, I completed my master's at Full Sail University for public relations. It's funny because when I first told my parents I wanted to be a journalist, it's like they were like scared or something like I don't understand. It's like they had to, like I said, I wanted to be a stripper. I mean, it's not wrong to be a stripper, but like it was weird. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand the problem. Like, why well, can't I be a journalist? And that's when I looked into it. Apparently, during the Duvalier regime, journalists were the main target of his anger because journalists tell the truth. Well, back in the day, they actually did. They were very non-biased and they would tell both sides of the story. But in this case, as you guys saw in my other video, there was no both sides to the damn story because at this point, there's people dying, people are hungry, people are sick, and most importantly, people are tired. So they would report on these things. They would report on how people were living under the regime, how people were affected by the regime. And um, Duvalier did not like that, okay? Jean-Francois had a lot of journalists killed. A lot. The Duvalier regime as a whole had a lot of journalists get killed. And it's, it's crazy because I'm like, oh wow. That's probably why my parents kind of associate like a fear with me being a journalist. Cause I guess they don't want me talking shit for a living because they think I'm gonna get killed. I mean like, he should never die. But anyhow, he also created the quickie divorce law, which a lot of you may know about. And Haiti, I don't know if this is still a thing, I'm sure it is. You can get a divorce decree in 24 hours which also helped spark a huge demand in tourism to Haiti. He launched reforestation camps. He even started cleaning up the jails, y'all. He also opened up the country to foreign businesses. So a lot of um, companies from Europe, Haiti or whatever, came to Haiti to establish their businesses because A, it is cheap, and B, they definitely took a lot of interest and happiness with the Tonton Makut that would basically go against anyone and basically destroy all the unions that were set forth anyway to protect their workers from um, human rights. Protect workers' human rights. You see how bad that sounds? That, that, that don't sound good. Because we already know in Europe and most like first world countries, there are unions and other type of laws that protect workers from being mistreated or underpaid. In Haiti, yeah, it was basically what the elite said, what the elite did, and if the elite didn't like it, it was gone. The Tonton Makut helped enforce that. So a lot of foreign companies came in and they were taking advantage of that. What? They was like, Psh, no unions? Tonton Makut? What? Like, they flew to Haiti. He also replaced a lot of former cabinet members who were like a lot older, to be honest, with a lot of new younger candidates. On the outside, it was looking good. He was doing a lot for the country and people weren't as upset. People weren't as afraid because he was more friendly. Now with all of these changes, foreign aid to Haiti increased by 800%. Now I'm gonna just have to tell you guys right now, this does not mean that the Tonto was not still out here kidnapping people and silencing those that were opposed. It does not mean that people were not going missing for no reason. This does not mean that 
people were not starving. This does not mean they stopped those ridiculous taxes to build shit and fund their lifestyles or whatever the case may be. And this also doesn't mean that people were not thrown into jail, killed, murdered, or whatever, or extorted for money for absolutely no reason. I'm just telling you guys, there was some good that he did. With continuing his father's legacy of fear, but more on the back end, he found new ways to extort money from the national treasury. The thing is, unlike his dad, he just really wasn't smart with it, okay? And honestly, that was most likely the downfall of all of this. As I said before, Jean-Claude was not the brightest. He did not have much of a political background, but he actually did end up going back to law school because I guess at this point he really wanted to learn and have some type of something to back him because he was always being bullied around and bossed around by his mom and his sister. Like they were always telling him what to do, telling him how to do it, basically telling him he was not good enough behind the scenes. I guess he kind of wanted to have like some of an education to make sure he knew what he was doing and honestly a part of me really believes that he kind of wanted to help but shit got really out of hand and a lot of things were already in place before him and there were people behind the scenes that kept things that way because if you guys are not aware when it comes to presidents this is not even just america as you guys already know the president absolutely doesn't do much of anything it's the people in the office that does it's the senate it's the congress it's all of that those are the people that really do anything and then after that you got the people that are talking in the president's ear in the congressman's ear in the senator's ear those are really the people the wives the sisters the brothers anyone that is remotely close to these politicians usually are able to sway these politicians into a positive or a negative note. So I feel like it's not just him. I feel like it's the whole entire Duvalier regime, Duvalier family or whatever the case may be, as well as the elites of Haiti. The elites were loving this new Haiti. Now with all the good that he did, a lot of people were sitting there like, mm, it's just a show. He just did that so they can get more money so he can take this money and use it for his lifestyle. Now you guys have heard me mention this lifestyle quite often in this video. That's because, what did I say in the beginning? Jean-Claude liked his rich boy lifestyle and that didn't stop during presidency, okay? He was living lavish and he made sure he flaunted it. And honestly, this is also part of his downfall. But it wasn't that bad until he married Michelle Bunet. June 5th, 1980, in a ceremony so lavish that the Guinness Book of Records lists it as one of the three most expensive weddings, Haiti's 28-year-old president for life, Jean-Claude Duvalier, marries Michelle Bennett, a divorcee and mother of two. Michelle Bennett is what really fucked him up. He could have been in power for a good while longer if it wasn't for Michelle. People hated her. When I'm telling you hated her? Ready? She's a bum. Michelle Bennett, she's a prostitute. She makes voodoo to take jumpers and all the time she takes marijuana. Okay. Spending money, millions and millions of dollars. Michelle Bennett, That's what she meant. everybody call her is a lesbian. She was a devil. lesbian. She tried to, to eat all the t little children. For sacrifice. Okay. That's what she meant. By sacrifice. No charge about the former first lady seemed too extreme. Throughout the country, chants and lurid songs about Michelle's sex life rang out on the streets. Graffiti and crude drawings appeared on walls. Yo, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, I can't. I was just like, yo, it was so hard to dig up information on this lady. I had to go ask around. But there are so many rumors about who she was and what she did and why people didn't like her. But one of the main things you guys have to understand with the Haitian culture is that Haitians can be very judgmental. Of course, not all Haitians. I don't even know why I have to even say that. Clearly, I'm not talking about all Haitians. But there are a good chunk of Haitians who are very judgmental. Michelle Bennett was already married and already had two kids. And in the Haitian culture, that's a no-no. If you don't have kids, if you've never been divorced, you do not go and take someone. Already had kids, they've been divorced. Because to them, that's used goods, that's more problems, and that person is not pure enough, okay? They don't care if you thotting and bopping, okay? They don't really care too much about all of that frivolous stuff. It's more so of a, but do you have kids? But have you been married to them? So for them, it's like, we have our, our handsome, ugh, I saw some people saying he was handsome, and I was like, whoa, that's, that's sickening. 
<laughs> we have our handsome president marrying this used, washed up thought. No. People were saying that she was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, and overall she just was not a good person. But one thing that I saw that was really interesting to me was reports of people saying that his father, so Papa Doc, okay, Jean-Francois Duvalier, had actually killed or exiled some people in Michelle Bennett's family. Now, I'm not sure how true this is because I couldn't find too much information on it. And anyone I asked didn't know either. So if you guys know anything more about Michelle, comment it down below because I think Michelle could be a whole other video because people really did not like her. Michelle came into the government through the bedroom and she brought down the government in five years through her greed. When Marc Bazin became Haiti's finance minister in 1982, he quickly became suspect by questioning the national budget, 30% of which he says went directly to Baby Doc and Michelle. So $60 million went for his and her personal use? Absolutely. Every but, year? Oh, yes. And that was just official open corruption because it was coming out of the budget. Him marrying Michelle really is what fucked up the Duvalier regime. Now, Michelle was also a mixed woman. And if you guys are not aware, Papa Doc was always with this whole pro-black rhetoric. He was very restore Haiti to the black upper class. Black people should have power in Haiti. Black people should be the elite not the other way around because for as long as we can remember shit even still now the elite of haiti are mostly mixed and black but a lot of them at that time specifically were mixed it was one of his most important points and one of his most important points of his campaign to basically restore order to the black people you know black power da, da, da. so not only did you marry a mixed woman but now she out here running amok in the palace not me running amok in the palace oh no let me tell you, honey, I gotta take my glasses off for this. So, remember how I told y'all Baby Doc was always being bossed around by his mom and his sister? Oh, nah. After the marriage, none of that. Now, you guys are probably like, well, that's his wife, as he should. You know, he got listen to his wife now. No, no, no. She kicked the entire family out of the house. The mom's family, the sister, all of that got kicked out of the palace. So, at this point, now she can control him. But by all accounts, he was always dominated by his sister and mother. And once Michelle purged them from the palace, she emerged as the unrivaled force behind the throne. Joe Namphy, the brother of the new leader of Haiti, businessman and perennial insider, he explained that an altogether different first lady was surfacing inside the palace. She took over literally this country, and within one year, she had kicked out of the palace Jean-Claude's mother all of Jean-Claude's mother's relatives, 98 of them, were exiled. So she literally went after the, 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 the Duvaliers with a, with a vengeance, I mean, to, to literally exert her power. And to make matters worse, she wasn't controlling him in a good way. Her, she was sitting there flaunting all the money that they have embezzled literally from the national treasury all over the place. Almost overnight, her father, Ernest Bennett, who was reportedly on the verge of bankruptcy, became a wealthy man. With his daughter in the palace, he paid no export taxes and soon cornered much of the coffee trade. The majority of the country's 7 million citizens earn less than $150 a year. And for more than a quarter of a century, the Duvaliers used their power to extort nickels and dimes from every transaction carried out by these desperately poor people. Even U.S. aid shipments were often diverted and sold for profit in the marketplace. By the time of his marriage to Michelle, Baby Doc is said to have amassed a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, at this time in Haiti, and I believe during the entire Duvalier regime, both Baby Doc and Papa Doc, there was only one TV channel in Haiti. One TV channel! And um, they can control the channels, like in the palace. They control the channels, so basically they controlled everything that everyone watched. If that's not a dictatorship, I don't know what it is. And on this channel, Michelle took the liberty of basically showcasing how philanthropic she was. I'm not joking, I'm not kidding, bro. She started a whole foundation, charity, whatever. I think it was called like the Michelle Bennett Foundation or some shit. She was seen kissing babies, hugging children. Listen, it was a show. 
It was a show. This would be broadcasted all over the country. Anyone that had a TV was watching this because you ain't had no choice. That was the only channel and they were all forced to watch it. As First Lady, Michelle immediately enlisted Haiti's TV network to promote herself as a champion of the poor and to solicit contributions for her Michelle Bennett Duvalier Foundation. Every day, the elegant First Lady was featured in scenes like this, launching vaccination campaigns, touring hospitals, giving her heart to the people. It was a powerful image that won over even such a symbol of saintliness as Mother Teresa. I forgot to mention this in the video, but as you guys are going to see, yeah, sis got a whole Mother Teresa endorsement, which is wild because not too long after that, the Pope came over there and was like, okay, um, you guys seem to be doing well, but why does your country look like this? Things must change. And after this, this is when the world began to see what was truly going on in Haiti. I have seen many people coming and kings and people, presidents and prime ministers, but I have never seen the poor people being so familiar with their heads of state as they were with her. It was a beautiful lesson for me. I have learned something from you. So, thank you. The Pope's visit in March 1983 as the first challenge to Baby Doc and Michelle. The Pope was going beyond the Duvaliers, standing by him, and telling the Haitian people, I don't agree with what they're doing. We cannot have this scandalous wealth side by side with the abject poverty. Things have got to change. And from that speech of the Pope, uh, the message went out that uh, the Duvalier regime could no longer continue the way it was continued. I guess she really wanted to look good. She really wanted people to think that she was like this grand pool bar. And she was very, very, What's the word? Conceited, but not the good type of conceited, okay? They were literally taking all of the money from Haiti and basically leaving everyone hungry and upset. And I think that's what a lot of people were really mad about. First of all, their wedding was in the Guinness World Records for one of the most expensive weddings. How, bro? How the... I was sitting there like, they gotta be fucking kidding me. The money they spent on that wedding could have done so much for Haiti. The money they spent their entire regime could have done so much for Haiti. And I think that's what really pisses me off about this. What really makes you hit the fan is when um, the most philanthropic, beautiful, amazing Michelle Bennett decided to have a banquet. Like a, a banquet gala type of situation. With all the elite. You guys are probably like, okay, what's wrong with that? I mean, that's what rich people do. Oh, no, 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 no. They broadcasted this live on that national channel. The cadence, the, the champagne that was being offered. I remember that night they didn't give Don Pena, they gave Krug. Very expensive. The most goddamn expensive champagne in the world. Haiti had never seen anything like it. Ministers' wives dressed in Parisian gowns, a jeweler flown in from Paris to present a $30,000 necklace as a door prize. I watched this and I said to myself, I wonder how they never understood what they were doing to themselves. The most bouge of the bouge was this, this gala. And it's being broadcasted to the entire country that is practically suffering emotionally, physically, psychologically. They're poor. They can barely find their next meal. And by this time, the average Haitian was earning less than $100 a year. Now you have the nerve, the God, the audacity, televised, nationally televised, a gala with a bunch of rich elite people. Oh, you already know the Haitians was mad as hell. Benefit to raise money, but the clash of that luxury, that display of wealth versus their poverty situation was just too much for anyone to digest. So the Haitians did what they did best. Revolt started in Gournaïve and basically took over the entire nation. People were pissed and as they rightfully should. There is also a theory out there that suggests that Michelle Bennett did all of this on purpose to basically avenge the death or the disappearances of the many in her family that Papa Doc did. This is just a theory, but yeah. 
to be honest they should have been pissed before but i guess at this point it was just like all right now nah, bro enough is enough and this is mainly because a lot of people saw this as baby doc giving the power to the mixed elite which is completely against what Papa Doc wanted. Even though Papa Doc was actually married to a mixed woman as well, she knew her place, okay? She was she was there, but she wasn't out here flaunting her riches and flaunting her privilege in front of other people. She wasn't out here flexing like a shit didn't stink. Okay? She was literally just there, you know, being the first lady, and that was that. Like, she didn't really have that much of a loud presence. Meanwhile, Michelle Bennett, boom, already had a bad reputation. Boom, she mixed. Boom, she flaunted. Boom, she lying. Like, it's just, no. People be like, behind every powerful man is a powerful woman or whatever the case may be. Oh, that was Michelle. You guys are probably like, okay, how the hell did he let her run him up? Well, one, pussy is power. Two, the mom and sister not there no more. And three, she was a bitch, apparently. According to a lot of people who knew her and did interviews about her, she was not the best person. Like, she was very, very bratty, really catty, and she would throw tantrums anytime she didn't get what she wanted. She would be very, very upset. She would throw things in the palace. She would break things in the palace. She would order people to be hurt if they defied her orders. She was not trying to deal with her attitude and her tantrums, to be quite honest. It was dumb. Because when Michelle was speaking, uh, and she w she w she would shut him up. Yes, she would shut him up. Uh, in the cabinet meeting. Oh uh, well, she insult anybody at any time. Nobody could resist her. Obla Jolicoeur, Haiti's omnipresent journalist and gossip columnist, and recently appointed Secretary of State for Information. Were people afraid of her? I beg your pardon. She was. She frightened everybody. And people avoided her because try to avoid her because if she does not get what she wants, she would cry, she would try to break everything, she was hysterical, she would go ex hysterical. She was very powerful, if not more greedy and more powerful than Baby Doc himself. Behind all of this philanthropy was a monster. All of these protests got extremely out of hand. Tonto Maku was out here slaying people at the protest. It was really disgusting. And they were hanging on for a good little minute, okay? They were trying to act like nothing was happening. And we are still here. And then they were trying to keep things under control, you know, lay low. But, you know, that didn't work out for too long. Michelle Bennett spent millions of dollars. And I'm not talking about million dollars a year. I'm not talking about million dollars a week she would spend millions of dollars at a time on just shopping sprees now this one shopping spree where her and her friends went to france and spent over a million dollars in one day sitting there freaking buying furs and shit was what really ticked a lot of haitians off because it was like what the fuck at a time when haiti was on the verge of bankruptcy unable even to buy fuel for its trucks and buses and facing food shortages that Michelle and an entourage of 14 set off on a fateful shopping trip to Paris. The first time people got very angry because Michelle spent a f a one million for one week and then asked for a second million from the govern governor of the central bank and she got it. And uh, we understand that she spent 1.7 million dollars. On what? On clothes, on paintings, on fair coats and also refrigerator for the fair coats. When Michelle went back to Haiti uh, with all these furs that she bought abroad, that's not the first time she's bought furs, uh, she has special parties for her friends who also have furs. And Haiti is a tropical country. So at that point, they turn on a special room, very cold, like a freezer, really, so they can put on their furs. We're hungry. We're stressed, we're tired, we're dying, and this chick out here going to France to buy luxury fur and going million dollar shopping sprees. Like, what's going on? So people started to get real, real antsy. Now, what's crazy is you guys are probably like, okay, but what happened with Papa Doc? Like, why didn't they get mad at that? See, the thing is with Papa Doc, he wasn't doing all of that goofy shit. Yeah, he was definitely embezzling money and all of that shit. But he wasn't sitting there doing no stupid shit like going on million dollar shopping sprees and having everyone find out about it, 
sitting there displaying all the philanthropy that they're doing on the national channel make themselves look good while everyone is hungry it's like how are you doing charity but my ass still hungry but what about the first lady's foundation and the millions of dollars she had raised on behalf of the poor that was joseph Carter. joseph Carter. also i gotta remind you guys people were very afraid of papa doc and ain't nobody was gonna say nothing to him with baby doc people weren't really afraid of him they were more afraid of the tonto makut so they were like kind of like there and everyone else like everyone else was way more scarier than baby doc like baby doc didn't put much fear in anyone's heart more so the tonto makut and just the fact that at this point, y'all been in years of bondage, like mental bondage, spiritual bondage, shit, like everything is just fucked up at this point. So I guess at that point, they were compliant to the shit that they were already used to. A lot of the things that actually looked good were the tourist spots, the capital, you know, like the more affluent parts of Haiti looked really good, okay? Other than that, everything else pretty much looked the same, if not worse. People were still illiterate, people were still hungry, people were still dying going missing, going into exile. A lot of professionals were still fleeing the country. Like, it was a mess. So we've had these people in power for how long nothing's happening, but they could be sitting out here, flying all their money, acting like they're doing charity. What kind of charity is this? I don't know what type of game you trying to run, but I ain't fucking with it. Baby Doc was literally sitting back and letting all of this happen. In fact, they would roll around in a luxury car, which I believe was a Benz, I don't remember. If I could find the clip, I will insert it. And they would literally like throw money to the poor people. I'm not even joking. This scene came to symbolize the blind arrogance of Baby Doc and Michelle's regime. The dictator hurling small change to the poor, while he and his wife extorted hundreds of millions. What I knew about Big Doc before making this video. The fact that they would roll around, him and his wife would roll around throwing money to the poor kids. That's what I remember. And when I looked into it, I was like, woo child, this is worse than I thought. Because um, eventually the United States was like, listen, your country's in disarray and y'all gotta leave. So the United States helped them exile. And in February 7th, 1986, they flew, they fleed the country. Wait, flew the country. They left, y'all. They left in the middle of the night with their two children. I believe it was like 2 a.m. The U.S. Air Force supplied them with a jet and they basically moved to France. But yeah, that was after they already embezzled about $800 million. $800 million from Haiti through that entire regime. And I believe that's just his section. I believe this is Baby Doc. I don't even believe this is including Papa Doc. Unexpectedly, just before dawn on the 7th of February, the 29-year-old Duvalier dynasty came to a close as Baby Doc and Michelle drove through a gauntlet of newsmen to a waiting U.S. Air Force jet that flew them to exile in France. They had managed to get an estimated $800 million out of the country, leaving behind less than 500000 in the treasury. Duvalier regime stole hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even billions at this point, of dollars from Haiti. And we will never see that money again. Lots of families were torn apart, are still torn apart because of it. Many people do not know what happened to their family members. Many people died in prison for no reason. Many people were persecuted because of their beliefs. There's of different types of political parties were persecuted for having different opinions. Anybody who was against the government was tortured, harassed, like it's a mess. And there were so many human rights organizations trying to get into Haiti, trying to help, trying to get to the bottom of things, but there was like no paper trail of any of this, like none. And to this day, Haiti is still investigating everything that Duvalier has done. So you guys are probably wondering what happened next. Well, since they did flee to France, even though France really didn't want them there, they were looking at them like, nigga, no, like we do not want you here. But I mean, somehow they ended up staying there anyway. Michelle and Baby Doc ended up getting a divorce. And later in 2011, he had the nerve, the gall, the audacity to pop up back in Haiti. There's a lot of speculation around this. A lot of people believe that he went back to Haiti to try to secure his Swiss bank account. Due to him possibly committing all of these human rights crimes, the Swiss banks and any other banks he probably had was not trying to give him his money because he was technically under investigation of some sorts. People were saying that he was basically trying to prove a point by going back to Haiti and being like, hey, they don't hate me anymore. Nothing's going on, there's no investigation. But no, 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 no. Him going back to Haiti opened up old wounds. He made his comeback to Haiti like 
right after the earthquake. Now, not only are these people already poor and stuff and um, stressed, they done forgot about you. You ain't been here in over, what, 20, 30, whatever plus years. They're grieving over their family members that have potentially died in this earthquake. And now you're going to come back for the fuck what? Now, he said that he was there to help. You know, he wanted to be there for his country. That, 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 that. But um, who knows? I believe in the Swiss account situation, but maybe God touched his heart. Okay, maybe he came to actually help and try to reverse some of that karma he done did or let happen. But um, yeah, the government wasn't having it and he was arrested and set to appear many times, okay? Which he refused many times. And he actually ended up staying in luxury hotels in Haiti during this entire ordeal. Personally don't understand how the fuck he was even able to step foot in Haiti and not be killed. <laughs> This was Haiti last February, just after the dictator Baby Doc Duvalier fled the country. But what these familiar scenes did not reveal was the extent to which the passions and anger of the Haitian people were focused not just on the dictator, but also on his wife. When they left Haiti, they left everyone behind. They only took their immediate family for the most part. Tonton Makut was still in Haiti. All of those elites were still in Haiti. All of the people that were their friends and extended family were still in Haiti. And those protests were not just, hell no, we won't go. They were taking revenge. A lot of Tonton Makut got killed after they left. They left a lot of people hanging, like on some real fuck shit. The body of this Tonton Makut, a hated Duvalier security policeman, was roasted and paraded through the streets of the capital. When we talked to the people who murdered him, they told us that Michel Duvalier had ordered the man to poison the water supply of the capital and that they had killed him before he could carry out her orders. Who told the Makut to do that? Michel Benet. Michel Benet. Michel Benet. Michel Benet. Michel Benet. In Haiti, people's anger was reduced to acts of symbolic vengeance. But in New York, Michel's brother was attacked in the streets and in Paris, the Duvalier's financial advisor was beaten and hospitalized. So not only does he have the blood of all the people he let die or had get killed, but he had the blood on his hands of basically his friends, basically people that he employed, people that were related to him. To this day, anyone with the last name Duvalier gets interrogated and probably can't even step foot into Haiti without security. So I don't even understand how the fuck he was even able to stay in any type of hotel. I really don't even understand it. He really let those people hang. People attacked them. People came after them. Bruh, there's one video of them literally parading the fact that they killed a Tonto Makut because they claim that Michelle sent him on a mission to poison the water supply in Port-au-Prince to kill all the people. Okay? And they literally are parading this man like on a stick, like burnt up and everything. like. Y'all, it's a mess. So I, I don't understand how he was able to get back into the country. But nonetheless, the government did its job and they were basically seeking charges against him. But there was lots of talk about this because it was like, you know, it's beyond the statute of limitations. Because if you guys do not know, when it comes to a lot of crimes, there is a statute of limitations, whether it's assault, rape, or in this case, extortion, embezzlement, um, corruption, shit. The list goes on and on. There is a statute of limitations in terms of time that you will have or time you are allotted to dispute these type of things and press charges for these things at this point it's been what 20 years plus whatever the case may be it's beyond the 10 years usually 10 years is about the statute limit for a lot of things so there was lots of talk about that it was like a lot of loopholes it's a lot that goes into that you guys are gonna have to look into that but sadly he ended up dying before he could ever really get any consequences for his actions on October 4th, 2014, he died of a heart attack at the age of 63 and was never ever able to stand a legitimate trial for all the crap that him and um, his family has done to people. Now what's really crazy about this is Haiti is still suffering from the actions of Baby Doc and Papa Doc. And what I find really crazy is the fact that there are a lot of people who are actually in cahoots with this. There are a lot of people who believe that the Duvalier regime was great for Haiti in terms of tourism, in terms of cleaning up the country and everything like that. And from everything I told you guys, you guys are probably sitting there like, how the hell is that possible? Nope, I don't want to hear it. To be honest, I don't want to hear it either. 
but I do have to admit from the outside perspective it did look better from the inside perspective it probably did look better for the people who weren't truly affected for the people who lived away from all of this mess near the capital people who didn't have family members who were beaten killed extorted or have businesses where they were taxed heavily or businesses that were literally targeted for extra money yeah michelle did that she literally um used the tonto maku to go to businesses and take money to um, basically fund her lifestyle and this is addition to the ridiculous taxes that they put on shit which made no sense because it's like how y'all putting taxes on shit when people are already poor it's ridiculous now the reason a lot of people may think that is again like i said they're probably just not directly affected by it and to add to that you need to keep in mind that there are a lot of haitians who believe that haitians are just unruly people i know a lot of haitians that are like anti-haitian a lot of racist haitians racist to your own fucking kind type of haitians i know that a good amount and they believe that Haitians are unruly, Haitians need order and the way the Devalier regime was handling Haiti was the best way because Haitians don't know how to fall in line, they don't know how to make decisions that are good for the country and there's too many thugs out there that ruin things for everyone so that type of government style is what is best for those type of people. I heard a lot of people say this, but it's funny because the people that have said this are usually the elite Haitians. It's usually the Haitians with a lot of money, the doctors, the lawyers, the ones that came here when they're really, really young, the ones that lived in Haiti during this and were living lavish in their palaces, not having anything happen to them, you feel me? Those are the people that I know that have said this. I don't know anyone that is like of normal Haitian standard who has said that. I really don't. The whole Divalier thing from my perspective, I've asked as well as what I've seen online, it looks like the people who were for him were people that were of power of some sort. They either were business owners, elite, already rich, whatever the case may be. They were not people, they weren't the common Haitian people. And to be quite honest, the common Haitian people is what matters because they make up the most of the country and they are the ones that suffered the most. I don't want to offend anybody who has been affected by the Duvalier regime, but uh, there are a lot of people who believe that they put Haiti on the map. Well, uh, whether it was in a good way or a bad way, I, I just, I don't really like that term because they did so much bad to put Haiti on the map, you know? It's like, it's kind of a slap in the face to the victims, you know? But let me know what you think about this down in the comment section below because I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's it for this video. Make sure you guys comment down below. I would love to hear your stories on if you have any stories about the Duvalier regime, if you happen to live in Haiti at that time, or if you know any family members. If you're going to ask your family, please be very delicate because there's a lot of people who are really traumatized by this error in Haiti. Also, please be mindful that this is not even the entire story. Please do your own research, like I said before. All my sources will be linked down below. This is my High on Haitian shirt. Go get it in the merch shop. That will also be linked down below. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, do all that. And I'm going to see y'all next.